All right. Guillermo, I'm off mute. I can go. Yes, you yes. can go. You're live. Good afternoon and welcome everyone to our first Council of the Americas Symposium Panel of 2021. My name is Susan Siegel and I'm the CEO and President of the Americas Society Council of the Americas. Today we have the pleasure of hosting a great group of business leaders to discuss the digital imperatives for Latin America in 2021 and beyond. I'd like to welcome Gaston Bottazzini, CEO at Falabella, Alvaro Cárdenas, President for Latin America and the Caribbean at Diageo, Cristina Palmaca, President for SAP Latin America Caribbean, and Ignacio Yurao, Yuror, sorry, the Chief Innovation and Digital Bank at BCI. Our moderator today will be Federico Muxi, Managing Director and senior partner at Argentina for Argentina and Chile at BCG. Now, this is gonna be a great panel talking about what I think is one of the most important discussions that we have today in Latin America. And all of you in the audience will have an opportunity to ask questions of our panelists towards the end of the program. In order to do that, please use the Q&A box that appears on your screen and the monitor the moderator will read the questions for you. Before I start, I want to thank our sponsors, Bank of America, the AES Corporation, Microsoft, MasterCard, Salesforce, SAP, Chubb Latin America, Diageo PLC, Greenberg Turig, our media sponsors, America's Quarterly and the Financial Times, and our partners at the Inter-American Development Bank. So without further ado, Federico, the floor is totally yours, and I really look forward to this conversation. Thank you so much, and enjoy the panel. So thanks, Susan, for the introduction, uh, and thanks to the panelists and to the big audience attending today's session. There was a, a fun American TV series uh, back in the 70s or maybe early 80s, that some of us may remember called here in Latin America, El Hombre Nuclear. Uh, in this TV series, it was an astronaut that after a flight accident uh, was essentially rebuilt with bionic implants. Mm -hmm. And the result was a person with a superhuman strength. Uh, and for those that may remember the series, well, I, I believe it may evidence something about your age. Well, leading companies today in multiple industries are combining the strengths of humans and of technology to create what we could call a superhuman or bionic capabilities. Most bionic leaders today are what we call digital natives. And for these companies, bionic processes come naturally. These companies are born with bionic capabilities. But more and more bionic companies can also be found in traditional industries. Incumbents are investing significantly in ambitious digital transformations to reposition their competitive capabilities for a bionic future, or, or I could say for the bionic present. Many of the elements of these bionic companies are well known. We can talk about artificial intelligence, digital talent, platform-based software or services, just as an example. But the formula for putting all these pieces together is neither obvious nor easy to implement. Today, we will explore how traditional companies think about transforming themselves into a superhuman enterprise. And we will learn from four great examples represented by BCI, Falabella, Diageo, and SAP. So we need to start with a brief reflection on what 2020 represented for all of us. Um, it has certainly been a very challenging year. Still, it has been a year full of learnings for all of us. 
and especially, very much especially in relation, in relation to digital transformations and how these processes have accelerated. So my first question for the four panelists is, what have your major learnings been from 2020? And more importantly, how do you think these learnings will shape you and your company going forward? So maybe let's start with Christina. Hi, Federico. Hello, Susan. So uh, glad to be here together with Alvaro, Gaston and Inácio on this important panel, especially kicking off 2021. Yeah, it seems that uh, 2020 was, uh, in, in some sense, uh, I heard from a, a one um, a special person saying that 2020 was a, a year to forget or that didn't exist. And in fact, for me, it was a year for so many learnings. I think we learn as companies. Uh, to be uh, adaptive, we need to adapt uh, on a circumstance that we never had this before. Uh, we had to manage how to manage on, on so big uncertainty, how to live on this digital uh, world. So even though for SAP, which we are pretty much a technology company and it was easy uh, to be remote from one day to another, yeah, we took uh, 100,000 people across the world, 5,000 here in Latin America, on a, on a, let's say, smooth transition for the digital world. Uh, but we need to reinvent ourselves. We are technology, but we are really a human company. We are on the, on the whole capital or human capital approach. So we learn how to uh, deal with uh, uh, business continuity of our customers. We know how to make demonstration and uh, proof of concept digitally. Uh, we had projects going live uh, during the start of the pandemic and during the course of the pandemic. And in fact, uh, Federico, what we learn is can be productive and very efficient on the digital world. Now, I had one customer in Peru saying uh, that uh, they, they really had the project over the pandemic and say, so, you know, that we were much more efficient than when we were in person, person because we were really focused to solve a problem. We started, we were pretty uh, dedicated to that uh, ambition, and then we move on. So it was very uh, well conducted. Yeah, that was good. So I think on the productivity side, we learn a lot and we are much better on that perspective. And especially in Latin America, we are very punctual with all the meetings and all the aspects on that perspective. But we are also human. So I think we really lost the human contact. So having the capability of being together, especially when you talk about creativity and innovation being part of this um, uh, development of uh, a, a variety of alternatives, I think this is the part that we need to, to really take care also on the whole mental uh, health approach, even though we put a lot of focus and a lot of programs on that perspective, of course, we need this human touch. So from one side, we are more productive, more agile, uh, more adaptive. But I think uh, at the end, we are all looking how to make this uh, combination with the social perspective that is super important for us, especially in Latin America. Thank you, Christina. I think that many of us have felt you know, that way. Gaston. What was it like at Falabella? He's on mute. I think Gaston, that you're on mute. I was uh, giving a speech to the computer for a while. I'm sorry. So thank you, Federico and Susan, for the invitation to be here with you today. Um, I'd say it's very consistent with what Christina described. I think in our case, uh, one of the things that we really learned was that we are able to adapt uh, a lot more than we thought we were. Uh, this is a very large organization, and like all retails organizations, also very spread out, 100,000 people spread out over seven countries, and uh, with situations that were very different in each one of those seven countries at any point in time. And the ability of people to adapt to, this, to the different situations was quite impressive for me, as well as the ability to make decisions very fast. And I think the whole pandemic, one of the learnings we had is we could make relatively drastic decisions or decisions that had been lingering uh, for a while uh, in a very short uh, period of time. Um, and I think that also was a, was a learning from the pandemic. And a third one I think is the level of autonomy and uh, ownership that very small teams uh, could get, you know, very spread out, 
not easy to connect so many people and uh, and um, and have consistent decision making, uh, but with very few um, very few concepts around which people had to gather, people were able to make very very good decisions at a very local level. No, that's very interesting, uh, Gaston. Uh, and let me highlight the point you make on, on on how fast decisions were taken, right? And 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 in some cases, very you know game changing decisions um, that potentially before the pandemic, you know, had you know lengthy periods of of decision making, uh, and now we're taking in a matter of days or weeks. No, I think that's that's a great learning as well. Ignacio, but banking was a, an industry that was you know highly impacted as well. Um, how, how did you live through 2020? Well, intensely. <laughs> well, but first of all, thank you, Fede and, and Susan for inviting me. Um, and very much in the vein of uh, all the speakers here, it's no doubt that 2020 was a very, very challenging year. Uh, but it's also no doubt, no doubt that it uh, sped up a behavioral change that was already in the works as our clients uh, became much more digital, and even in some cases, they start to abandon the more traditional channels. Um, but I would say that during the last year, we did not only experience some significant challenges, uh, but we also faced a new scenario in which we were finally conscious uh, regarding how fast the changes were coming. And uh, the new normal, at least for the for the banking industry, uh, has become become a constantly changing landscape. Uh, so 2020 was not only about like a, a, about a sudden rise on the traffic in our digital channels, but also I would say a, a very welcome well, uh, wake up call uh, for the need of a much more flexible decision making processes for a much more empowered middle management for a much more purpose-driven uh, culture within the company, et cetera, et cetera. So I would say 2020, in summary, provide full evidence for the, need and, or for the need of an organization that should be constantly adapting to change at a much more faster uh, pace than before. For, for at least for us, for, for DCI, for banking industry, Last year lessons were that if we want to remain competitive in the digital world in order to serve a much more demanding and ever changing uh, customer preferences, we must build a much more flexible and power and risk taking organization. So thanks Ignacio and, and let me highlight uh, maybe two, two things that you mentioned. One, the acceleration concept or so mm -hmm. trends that we were, you know, seeing before the pandemic that you know dramatically accelerated during the last year and also what you mentioned about purpose and, and we will get back to this concept uh, later on in the discussion i think it was a year in which you know many companies uh, specifically in the banking industry but also you know elsewhere stepped up and stood up for their clients and and, and to, to support you know the, the more broader view of, of 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 the value chain and of the environment in which they operate so thank you for your views. Um, Alvaro, I think that, you know, the, the spirits industry and in general, the consumer goods industry has been also highly impacted during the pandemic. What are your views around, you know, 2020? Yeah, thanks, Federico. Um, thanks for the, for, for the invitation for you and Susan as well. And nice meeting you, Cristina, Ignacio, Gaston, um, even if it's virtually. Um, look, I think, uh, I. I as a, as the agile as a company that you know our our purpose is celebration life everywhere mm -hmm. and every day and that we lived a lot mm -hmm. about so socializing our consumers socializing in the on trade in the out of trade in events concerts etc you know obviously the the pandemic has a massive impact uh, for us but i think uh, one of the before getting into a reflection around what we've learned as an organization. I think my first reflection is what I learned as a leader. 
No, and I think this pandemic forces us to unlearn, to create a capacity to learn again. I think the lines between atoms and bytes basically disappeared. And that distinction in our minds about the analog and the digital world also disappeared. So I think uh, I think one of the the, 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 the most positive things that I you know took out of, of 2020 was this this ability of learn again and that curiosity around you know what is um, what is happening and how how we as human beings we are adapting to this new reality. I think as an organization, uh, the impact was was massive. And I think one of the first things that we said to us is that we want to emerge stronger, you know, and emerging stronger was not just from a business perspective, was from a business cultural um, and, and the entire holistic aspect of us as an organization. And I think there are two key things that this has completely reframed to us. One is around, this has really broke the consumer at the center of the organization. I think we used to say to, you know, in our own minds that the consumer was the most important thing, but actually we're not, we were not that close to the consumer, but this, you know, acceleration in consumption behaviors and the change in consumption behaviors and how the consumers behave, how they shop, how they interact has really forced us to put the consumer at the center. And that has been brilliant. Um, because we, as an organization, I think we all used to look at the past to predict the future. And with the base and the past is irrelevant because the, the, the situation has changed so much that forced you to look from, from an outcome, from what the consumer is doing, to use the data that you've got, to not wait for perfection about having the perfect data lake to understand consumers and help customers to survive. You've got to manage with 60% of the information and 70% of information and start to lay hypotheses to move forward. So I think uh, this has been, that has been one of the most remarkable changes. It's around how this has really helped us to start to use the past to predict the future and how as an organization, our, our obsession at this moment is shaping the future every day and surprising consumers and customers in everything that, that we do. Um, so I think there are, there are many things that are changing. So our road to markets are changing. Yeah, because all those traditional road to markets now are facing B2B marketplaces. You know, now the, the, the power and the choice is in the hands of, a, of, a, of an outlet owner in, in a mobile phone deciding when I'm gonna buy, when, in which place I wanna buy. You know, um, so the, the, the total value equation has been completely reframed. And I think one of the most important aspects is the cultural or those those uh, those organizations that were, you know, quite shy in this diversity and inclusion journey um, are really rethinking. Um, and that was our experience as well. We want to attract the talent that we need to attract to deliver the future that we need to deliver. As an organization, we've got to change. You know, doing the, doing the exceptional things that we were doing in the past are not going to make the, the attractive organization to attract the talent that we need to deliver the future and attract those new capabilities. So I think, uh, you know, that the impact has been massive, uh, but I seriously um, consider that has been one of the most positive things that uh, from an organization perspective and humans being potentially has been happening, recognizing how difficult it has been at the same time. No, I think you've touched on, on so many relevant topics, eh, Alvaro, on, on how many things are, have happened during 2020, right? You know, from, from um, how leaders need to unlearn on how to behave and make decisions to how, you know, consumers are drastically changing their consumer patterns. And we need to use data, not from the past, but from the present to predict on, on, on what they want and how they will behave, behave going forward. Um, to how you know supply chains are completely deconstructed with new players, you know, you know, playing a, an increasingly important role. So, so maybe we can say we are certainly living through you know really interesting times, you know, and and you know, 2020 again, it was a year of you know change, but also of acceleration of patterns we were always also seeing um, in the past. So maybe moving you know to, to the to the road ahead. Right and, and how uh, your companies are transforming uh, in this you know extremely complex environment. Um, at BCG, when we think about the attributes that distinguish digital leaders, 
to me, the first one is, is one of a strong sense of purpose. And many of you have mentioned how you cared about your clients, about your employees. Uh, and I do believe that a purpose that guides, guides, that energizes, and that aligns the organization around what it's trying to achieve with these, you know, digital transformations is actually uh, really key. Um, you know, it, its purpose that makes, you know, companies put clients and other stakeholders at the center of these, of these efforts. Um, so, in this context, uh, Ignacio. Uh, BCI has launched Match uh, as a new digital platform um, that, that we understand is focused on the underserved segments of the population. Uh, can you elaborate on why is the bank investing in this new development and what purpose has to do with this? No, oh, sure. I would start with saying uh, that uh, for the last 80 years, uh, BCI has um, stay true to its mission. Uh, you, we just talk about purpose-driven companies, right? And um, part of that uh, mission is to make significant contributions uh, to the communities where we run uh, our operations. So in a country where I would say almost every Chilean already has at least a debit account, uh, much is not only doing that, but it's also allo allowing everyone within three minutes to have a, a free, simple, uh, transparent, and fully digital account, including an online credit card and a domestic uh, debit one, both for online and, and physical uh, uh, purchases. Match has already uh, about 3 million customers on a country where its entire population is roughly 70 million, and has also been adapted by 100 uh, thousand uh, small businesses as a, as a way to to receiving payments from their customer. And this year, we will uh, start offering also uh, credit and savings products and, and becoming a fully digital bank. And uh, in regard to your question, um, BCI is, is doing this not only because technology has allowed us to do so in a much more efficient and uh, profitable way, but also because we think um, it's part of our role as a, as a company on a, on a country with the characteristics of, of Chile. And, and because we still, we still think there are untapped opportunities to serve our customers uh, through a digital only model. Much has already about a million logins uh, to its app and processes more than 500,000 transactions every day. That gives us a great opportunity to take advantage of this enormous traffic for Chilean standards and to build intimacy with our clients while we build the, the digital bank of the future. So it's both uh, it's uh, the explanation behind behind match is both something that it's part of our mission, something uh, we need uh, to tackle, uh, especially in regard to the, the the social issues we face as a country, and also because we think there's a great opportunity to take advantage of that traffic and become a fully digital bank for the country. So it's interesting, um, Ignacio, how, you know, matching consumers' needs uh, and, and with a, you know, purpose-driven yeah. view of, especially on a segment that is currently underserved, but also seeing a business opportunity naturally in, in doing so, right? Yeah. Um, Gaston, um, you know, Falabella is, is very well known for, for being a very, you know, customer-oriented company and, and really putting, you know, customer satisfaction at the center uh, of, of your processes. Um, what has Falabella done specifically uh, in this regard to move towards becoming, you know, you know, more and more customer centric and what has digital, how has digital played a role here? Yeah, so Federico, I, I think the way we think about our purpose is transforming purchase experiences or shopping experiences 
and doing that by simplifying those experiences. And those experiences start with the browsing, continue with the shopping, and continue further with the financing of that purchase, et cetera. So we are looking at that whole experience and we are making it more and more technologically driven and data driven. And specifically, I think during this year, there are two or three things that we did to um, make that commitment to transforming the experience uh, tangible to the customer. One of those things is we expanded the loyalty program. Our loyalty program at the beginning of last year had 6 million participants. By the end of the year, it had close to nine to, yeah, close to 10 million participants. This means we have a lot more information, but we're also engaging a lot more customers in the region with the experience of shopping at Falabella. Another thing we did is, um, and looking at the later part of the, of the purchase experience is the financing. We developed a wholly digital account opening process, which allowed us in one year to replace 100% of the account openings. So 100% of the accounts we opened at the end of 2019 in our close to 300 stores, we are now opening 100% digitally. So that was you know, totally replaced, which means going forward, we could not only operate a lot more efficiently, but provide a much more seamless experience to the customer in terms of financing their purchases, et cetera. I think another movement that we made is make a further commitment to something we started in 2018, 2019, which is our commitment to the marketplace, the development of the marketplace platform. And the marketplace platform is very important in terms of increasing the assortment and the offering to customers and therefore creating a much more complete shopping experience. But it's also very important in terms of looking at the other end of the value chain and thinking about another set of customers which have traditionally been considered our suppliers and therefore just a negotiation process. Going forward, that changes completely. We're no longer looking at suppliers as a counterpart, but much more as a partner and as a customer. So that changes completely who, you know, what our customer set is, because all of a sudden the suppliers have become our customers and therefore a very important part of what we're doing by developing these marketplace capabilities is providing services to those suppliers dash customers. And lastly, I think the other area that is very important to the customer that comes also later in the buying experience is the delivery process. And the delivery process was uh, self-service while we have only stores. And now it has become a much more complex process for customers because we have to go all the way to their homes and in the midst of the pandemic that became quite a challenge. So we invested heavily in tracking, we invested heavily in integration with third parties for delivery. Uh, and that's another part of the customer experience that we need to transform drastically going forward. So in a nutshell, I'd say that technology is enabling a lot of change uh, and is enabling our ability to transform and simplify that customer experience, but at the same time is setting a very high bar in terms of everything we have to do going forward and many challenges. Yeah. Technology and data, as you mentioned, on, on, on how to use it to, to really understand how customers are, are behaving and serving them accordingly. Um, really interesting. Um, uh, I think maybe, uh, Alvaro, from, from your perspective on, on the Agio, um, you mentioned how the pandemic is also having a, a really profound impact on, on consumption patterns. Um, so how do you stay close to your customers? How do you adapt? How do you support them through this transition? And again, how's di how has digital enabled this? Yeah. So, Federico, I think, uh, look, starting with uh, the consumers, and I think uh, before getting into how the consumer habits has completely changed, um, how the consumer locations have changed, is our own consumer side also has changed. You know, they are more purposeful. Talk talking about purpose, they are more conscious about 
which brands are socially responsible, you know, which brands are standing for something bigger than sales, which brands are connecting with my own motivations. And getting that level of, uh, you know, insight and information within the reality that we face what mass, was massively challenging, which forced us to be very entrepreneur with data. And I think this is one of the points that I think uh, has been quite important for us because I think pre-COVID, we were all always, you know, especially I'm talking about the Agile, trying to have the perfect data lake, the perfect connection with information, the perfect understanding in order to start to make hypotheses to move forward. And I think one of the things that we were forced to is around with the data that we've got from a consumer perspective, how can we connect that data with the data that my distributor has from a cost from a customer and shopper perspective, you know, how what is the what the retail is doing, you know, what are the, the most broader spectrum of consumption? What is the data that I'm having? And I start to connect the dots that are the, that at the beginning potentially well, you know, made no sense. But then you can you started to create correlations to understand how the consumer, you know, was changing. So I think what one of the key things is around this uh, this transformation has really force us to eliminate eliminate the silos on how we saw the digital work. It's not about e-commerce, it's not about digital marketing, it's not about data. Actually, it's the connection of the entire ecosystem in a much more fluent way, what is going to give you the insights. So I think that is what has been, you know, the most uh, important transformation for us to really understand the consumer habits. So, which is really reframing and is how we interact with consumers every day. And I think one of the key challenges for us is around how can you interact the consumer more virtual without becoming transactional? Yeah. And, and I think that has been the other side around how the brands has, you know, has been forced to reposition themselves in order to maintain that perception about I'm here with you, even if it's remote and virtual, and I'm here with you with your socializing moment, your celebration moments. And uh, so the way of how the, our portfolio and the brands interact with consumers and, and customers and shoppers has been completely new and much more profound, connecting with the human side, not just the business side of the equation. No, very interesting, Alvar. I think that uh, when listening to the three of you, there's a clear connection between you know purpose, serving our clients, uh, better relating to suppliers, and supporting all of us with all of that with you know with technology and with data, right? Uh, so so let's maybe zoom into technology and data. Um, you know, digital champions across industry significantly invest on their technological capabilities, and they and they use you know data and artificial intelligence to drive pattern recognition, to inform predictions, to you know enable learning to hyper-personalize offerings to clients, to make better, faster decisions, to innovate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so maybe to you, Christina, um, uh, you're coming, you work for, and you lead a technology company, and most companies are, are in particular moving into embracing cloud as a key enabler of these digital roadmaps. Um, what's your view on how cloud-based solutions are helping companies in Latin America move forward and grow in, in, in this dimension? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we it's a digital imperative uh, session, right? So talking about technology is important, but so far we talked about purpose, about people, about uh, uh, how this whole experience uh, changed ourselves because the, the technology is just the enabler, right? That allows us to do so many different things. And for sure, it was an important element, especially during the pandemic, right? How, how to really uh, be agile to transform our business the way we were doing. So in the, in the whole the different segments that uh, we have here, the panelists and across the region, across the world, we saw how technology uh, enabled this transformation to take place. When we talk about probably the three parts that we um, we saw that was very impacted or very supportive for business continuity. Yeah, one supply chain. Yeah, we couldn't imagine uh, how we could survive 
without a very smooth supply chain across the board, right? Looking for uh, uh, components where they are. In the beginning, we were looking for APIs, whatever was available. So you need to be agile, you need to be fast, so you need to be connected. So we saw a big, big transformation on that perspective on the supply chain integration. And the, fast, the faster the company were ready on that sense, the better. The second, for sure, was the change on how the, the whole consumer behavior that was uh, impacted. Yeah, when all the stores were, were closed, we needed to find other ways of doing business, right? So, some uh, uh, companies were already ahead in terms of commerce, of marketplace, as we saw the example of Calabella, but not many of them across the, re the region. So, uh, and this was critical to really readapt the way that uh, the, the, um, the components, the products were available for the consumers. So commerce, the whole uh, uh, platform of experience of the customer perspective changes uh, dramatically. Here we see a lot of technology being able to connect and bring uh, this availability for, for the customers in terms of experience, in terms of connectivity. And we saw many uh, consumers that never, never had experience of buying online or having access to the delivery online uh, really jumping because this was the only available source uh, of, uh, of possibilities. And the third uh, that we saw in terms of the priorities were the whole change on the uh, workforce. Yeah, we all went to digital. We all need to find other ways to connect, to be uh, close to our customers. And the workforce management for sure changes for life, uh, not just uh, as we come back eventually to our offices one day. The hybrid model was also a, a cultural change that impacted dramatically uh, the companies. So that said, at the end of the day, is the change on the society and the technology is there to enable the change. And cloud is an offer that um, enable agility uh, to bring those perspectives to, to the customers uh, to be able to scale. So when we see now, for instance, some of the impacts of the vaccination, we were talking a little bit before, um, most of our of, the, of the, the companies that today are providing components, providing the, the vaccines, they run on our platforms and how fast they can react to really look on distribution, on production, on components. So I think here what, what I see is that the technology is not the, the end of the game, but is this enabler. And of course, cloud and using the, the information on the right way yeah, it's, it's a fundamental. And for sure, there are going to be a lot of discussions as there is already on how we use the data, how we, we take into consideration the whole privacy aspects, the whole uh, uh, environmental perspective of the impact of that data to ourselves, to our companies. And the companies, they have a big responsibility to comply to all those elements. Yeah, but for sure, there is a lot of material of, of elements for the companies to really take uh, advantage of the new approach, the new technology and really bring new business models for their customers and their the whole the whole society. No, absolutely. So, so, so technology as a key neighbor. Let, let me highlight a topic that we will come back to uh, later on, which is um, technology and cloud as a as a key enabler for collaboration across the value chain by you know sharing platforms and sharing information. We will come back to that topic because I think it's quite central to to the changes we are seeing. Um, there's been quite some talk you know, until now in the conversation about, you know, uh, data. Um, every, everyone knows, you know, leading edge companies uh, really regards data as, you know, pivotal in order to personalize offerings to clients. Um, Ignacio, um, this is certainly a trend in banking as well. Can you share with us how is data shaping the way BCI is interacting with its clients? Yeah, I would say it's shaping uh, our interaction like, like in every in every other in every other company and every other sector in every other industry, uh, and and I would also say that uh, last year that increases because of uh, as our clients move into a digital channels, uh, that has given companies the chance to learn a lot from our customers' behavior. You know the uh, it, and that's because the uh, the, the digital journey of a customer is a much more traceable one than, uh, let's say, if you go to a to a bank branch, oh, you have little chance to know what really happened there. But if the customers went through your your digital channels, you perfectly will know 
uh, what really happened there. Um, um, and very, I would say, in regard to something that Alvaro said before, I, I would also say that when it comes to data, if we want to act responsible and and be perceived as such, uh, we have to understand what we don't we do not own the customer's personal data, and and there's a paradigm that has to be shift and and change, um, and our customers' information should be considered as an asset, as an asset that there's that it's theirs, not ours, and um, and should be treated treated as such. Um, yeah, and as a bank, we 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 should not only treat our clients' information with uh, respect and confidentiality because that's what they expect and deserve. Uh, but also, we have the opportunity to give them value back from such data. Huh? Um, and uh, like everyone else in this room, we are certain that this data, that, that, that data should be at the core of our customer experience. So we have built a world-class data analytic division. But uh, the interesting th thing here is that uh, uh, the main uh, aim of that uh, unit is not only to offer the right product to the right customer uh, at the right time, which is great that they have to do that. But I think they also have to provide our clients with uh, recommendations that improve their financial health, especially on a country like Chile. Huh? Um, or today, more than a, a than a third of our customers already uh, use our AI financial head health powered assistant, and have, on over two thirds of our retail bank pro product sales are based on algorithms that channel offers through our Salesforce platform. So in order to, to, to answer your question, yes, data is shaping a new way of interacting with our clients. And, and BCI is both taking advantage of, uh, of it for our commercial processes, yes. But I would say um, we are also conscious that this comes with also new levels of responsibility. So interesting, Ignacio, that, you know, purpose is behind, you know, all of these changes and in particular in how we use data uh, as well. Um, so we have talked about technology and data as a key enabler, um, but to take the most out of technology, um, our teams, our organization uh, need to adapt. Uh, Gaston, can you elaborate on how has Falabella tackled this challenge of, uh, you know, working on how the organization needs to move to take the most out of technology and, and data? Yeah, I think that the first challenge is that we are uh, organized in all of our organizations, particularly traditional organizations around anything but the customer, right? And the first change that we need to embrace, and it, it's a very gradual uh, change, but, uh, but one that we have to pursue uh, very systematically is the change uh, on how we organize around the journey of the customer and break down the hierarchical, the functional barriers that we all have built over so many years you now and i think that's one of the ways we are doing it but it's uh it's um, particularly when you have such well-defined uh functions and responsibilities uh, and hierarchies in an organization to go from that to a an organization that really works around customer journeys not only in their digital solutions but in all of their solutions in, in how the store processes are set up etc is is a major challenge and that's one of the ways um, we are doing it the other uh, challenge that we have is uh, a cultural one is the tolerance to error uh, traditional companies uh, have uh, experience uh, experienced the cost of mistakes in a very hard way, because in the physical world, in an in a store, uh, misplacing an, an escalator or you know choosing the wrong location is a very very expensive error. 
in a web page, a design error is an error that you correct very fast. Not only that, you can run several design propositions to the to the customer, several results of search to the customer at the same time and do A-B testing and figure out what's the best and the customer, and here where data comes in again, the customer will tell you what's the best one. So you don't really need to commit so much and you can make a lot more mistakes, but that's a major cultural change when over so many years you were used that the cost of a mistake is very high and the value relative to that cost is low and that has flipped around completely and now the value is extremely high and the cost is almost zero. Uh, that's the second change that I think we're going through. Uh, and the last one I think is the is the challenge around talent. Uh, you know, you know, we are in a region that is going throughout this major transformation in all companies. So all companies are trying to get the right talent to lead that transformation at all levels of the organization. And obviously it's not readily available for all of us to do it. You know? So uh, we have developed partnerships with uh, educational uh, institutions in each one of the countries. But something else we did is we set up a um, digital factory in India. Uh, initially, its purpose was just to help us in one of the platforms that we're building, the e-commerce platform. Today, they are, you know, the India team at different parts of the process is involved in most of our technological er efforts and for sure in the most relevant platforms that we're building around marketplace, around payments, around financing, around logistics. Uh, and they have been not only very important as a source of talent, but also as a source of education on how to make all these cultural changes effective within the organization. So they have, all, you know, they have provided knowledge, but they also have provided a lot of cultural perspective uh, for us. And also working with people that are so far away and so far away, not only physically, but also culturally, makes the whole organization a lot more open, uh, which is another one of the challenges that we have is around collaboration and openness to a much broader set, set of diverse people than we have traditionally been open to. Uh, so I think it all comes down to that, to you know, changing the way we work, being more tolerant to error, incorporating talent with a much broader view of diversity and where it can come from, um, and, uh, and, and really in, through that increasing the pace at which we incorporate technology to our processes. No, really interesting, Gaston, and, and, and how, you know, completely, you know, changing the organizational uh, structure and, and, the, and the criteria with which the structure is built and changing the culture at the, at the same time and attracting this, you know, talent, which is, which is uh, certainly so difficult to attract that makes you go and, you know, as far away as India to, to get it. I, I think that's, that's a really great story. Um, I, I think this leads to, to, to the next topic I wanted to cover, you know, which is, which is on talent. Um, when I talked about bionic at the beginning, bionic is by definition, uh, tech and human. Um, and the human part, you know, all of you have been making references to it is, is really key. Um, ambitious companies and certainly the four companies we have on the table today, uh, need employees who have the sign and technical skills, as Gaston was mentioning, who are flexible, who are adaptable and, and able to learn. Uh, Ignacio, in the case of BCI, uh, how have you managed to attract and retain this type of, of new talent that is required? Well, it's not easy for a bank to be the first choice to for native digital ta uh, talents, right? After all, we are this is a landscape in which we compete with Google, Facebook, Mercado Libre, Amazon, and the like. And um, it's even harder when you, when your company is on a, I would say more or less stable, but far away, small country. 
but if there's one thing we can learn, and I'm, I'd like to go back to the purpose-driven company uh, topic we discussed earlier, um, is how important is transforming the organization into a, 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 a company of, of, of that uh, of that characteristics. And and that is because if we if we can if we want to be relevant for these younger talents, uh, talents where, that everyone's looking for actually, um, we can keep talking about return on equity or stuff like that. That's irrelevant for them, right? Uh, because today today's talent people not only as aspire to be well paid, and they certainly deserve it, so and to work on a financially successful company, they also want to be constantly uh, facing new challenges and being part of a project that can contribute for a better society. And uh, concepts like inclusion and the fight, the fight for a fairer society for everyone, not only should be part of our company's corporate mission. Today, I would say they're a key part of the value proposition for the younger generation. So if your company, uh, it's not a company where you can you can taste firsthand that this is a company where the owners and the senior manager management, it's committed for a better country, a better a better future, uh, for inclusion, for for all all that stuff. Um, there's no way you're gonna get that people into your company, no way. And uh, that was that was a, a fact before. It was very important before. Now it's a uh, mission critical today. So a clear link between your know, purpose and talent as well. I think that that's that's a great thought, Ignacio as well. Um, uh, Alvaro, in in your case, uh, what's your views on what? on how should leadership change to build you know this culture of innovation and this inclusiveness and this capacity to attract this type of talent what have you done at, at diageo yeah i think uh look i think before getting to the topic around how to attract talent i think one of the key things is around how how to accelerate the talent that you already have in the organization and I think uh, thinking about uh, the capabilities that you need from the future, et cetera, that you really need to, you know, put a lot of accountability in line managers to really work with people and give experiences to help them to get the capabilities that are required. So I think that's the first point before getting into how to attract the talent that you need. It's around um, how to be more bold or how to be bolder you know, of you know, identifying the genius in people and creating the right experiences for that to accelerate their own development journey. And I think our, around creating experiences, I think one of the key changes is that we have been moving from seeing careers as a collection of titles to seeing careers as a collection of experiences. And I think that ability of having cross-functional teams that are outcome oriented and that are not working in silos, you know, pretty much as Gaston mentioned as well. You know, having someone from supply leading up, you know, a Johnny Walker initiative, you know, having someone from Brandy leading at the digital journey. I think creating that cross-functional experience is going to be fundamental because it's, it's going to work in different dimensions. One is going to help you to create the right level of experience that you need in the organization today. But also it's going to give you, it's going to help you to break out those silos, you know, way of working that we traditionally used to have in the past. And I think that the, on attracting and retaining, I think one of the one of the key things around for any organization is around the expectation today for everyone from consumers and from people that want to join is that we become more socially responsible. So we need to work really hard in our reputation as a social citizen in every single market that we are operating. So the level of credibility that we need to have as an organization around diversity about not just gender, about ethnic diversity, about you know, half our employee base 
as a representation of our consumer base around how we are you know, working with governments and universities to develop the talent, the non-traditional talent pools, you know, from different socioeconomic levels, from different, different universities. You know, if we don't start to work with the society and with the government to start to help, you know, the non-traditional talent pools to rise and to raise, we will be in trouble because we will continue in this, in this constant talent war um, that we are, you know, today. And I think the last point, the last comment is around inclusion. And I think, uh, you know, when, when you think about the expectation of attracting someone in an industry like us, you know, of a company like the Azure, attracting, thinking about attracting someone from Google or from Rappi or from Mercado Libre, their expectation around, you know, their motivations and what they expect around flexibility, adaptability, et cetera, is quite different from those traditionally how we've been operating. So I think uh, how we make sure that the culture is, is so broad and so democratic and so inclusive that it that develops a sense of belonging to a much more broader spectrum of the one, of the one that we were <laughs> used to in the past. No, great, Alvaro. And I think that, you know, in coincidence with Ignacio, you know, again, purpose, social responsibility and culture as key to attract and retain the right talent. And also you mentioned the new ways of working on how to organize yourself not only to get closer to, to clients and to become really customer centric, but also as the way in which the new talent really wants uh, to work. Uh, we have a few minutes uh, still. Uh, let me switch to a last topic I wanted to cover, which is, um, which some of you have mentioned as well during the interventions, which is on, on how to collaborate with other companies uh, in the broader ecosystem. Um, uh, we are all listening about ecosystems and how they are becoming or they have become already uh, a really important phenomenon in, in, in businesses. Um, uh, a majority of companies uh, responding to a recent survey that, that, that we contacted at BCG said that participating on a digital ecosystem will be imperative to win uh, in the next three years. Um, so maybe Alvaro, to, to continue with you, uh, your business model at Diageo requires deep collaboration with players along the value chain. How is digital enabling this integration? Yeah, I think that that has been one of the most interesting changes uh, that is that are, that has been accelerating because I think uh, uh, again that before pre-COVID. There were clear lines between what is a soft risk, comp a soft risk company, what is an alcohol company, you know, what is a, you know, um, different kind of what, what is a, I know, a tobacco company or different kind of companies, yeah. Um, and there were very clear lines between how they operate in the marketplace. I think one of the key things with this um, with this transition that we are is that those lines have disappeared. So and now no one think about how to approach the marketplace as a soft drink company or as an alcohol company, is we are a platform of beverage. You know, and now we've got marketplaces that has been enabled by, you know, you know, due to this digital commerce, you know, acceleration that offers you a variety and offer our customers a variety, a much more broader, efficient and effective, you know, uh, road, to, road to market that what we used to have in the past. So I think uh, this is this uh, the collaboration has been completely refrained around, you know, a few months ago we, we thought that was impossible to collaborate with some of our own competitors. Today we are hand to hand with them because it's the most efficient way to, you know, uh, uh, to reach our customers. So I think uh, the the new pro proliferation of marketplaces has completely reframed the traditional road to markets that we've got in the you know in different markets across the region and across the globe, actually. That, that's an amazing transformation, Alvaro. Um, Ignacio, um, you know, some banks and, and, and many companies are focusing on developing you know, these ecosystems of partners in order to deliver your know, products and solutions to, to clients. What is BCI doing about it? Yeah, and very much in regard to something that Gaston mentioned earlier, uh, in our in our digital age, uh, customers demand end-to-end -end solutions. Huh? 
and they don't want us to push them products anymore. Uh, they ask for solutions, for experiences. And for a bank like, like BCI, this means that we can't offer a mortgage, a consumer loan, or a mutual fund anymore. Because our what our clients are truly demanding, it's full advice when buying a home or, or planning a holiday or securing their children's college tuition. But uh, of course, it's impossible for any bank to be able to fulfill all these expectations. We neither have the resources nor the ex expertise to do this. So uh, having acknowledged that, uh, we have built an API platform that should allow our customers to move freely without any ma major friction uh, along the different providers that could serve them better uh, for what they're looking for. We have integrate, um, already integrated real, real estate portals, supermarkets, uh, credit scoring data providers um, uh, into a much more wider uh, consumer experience where BCI provides the financial services uh, of which is well known for while uh, we act as an orchestrator of, of the whole customer experience. Huh? And um, uh, like everybody said before, uh, we also strongly believe that the future will be for those that offer, offer full frictionless experiences for our client needs. There's no way we can keep offering financial services without understanding uh, the needs of, uh, of our customers but now for a much more broader perspective. And with lots of collaboration, it's really yeah. interesting. And you mentioned, Ignacio, how technology is enabling this, and you, and you talked about and mentioned APIs. Maybe, Christina, having, uh, coming from a technology company, um, you know, uh, developing these ecosystems requires uh, strong technology developments, you know, APIs, Internet of Things, you know, new tools for data gathering and analysis. What's your view on how technology is enabling uh, this ecosystem place? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, sure. The, and, and the world, I think, changed a lot, right? Uh, the capabilities that the technology brought uh, are showing that uh, there is not one company that can deliver everything. There are companies that have more or less uh, solutions, but the world is built in a way that uh, the best companies and the best opportunities comes when you can uh, foster a very healthy ecosystem. So connecting uh, strong companies on the technology is good, especially on some complex topics, as we mentioned about data, privacy, et cetera. So there's, there's a, a huge uh, topic on that, but that you can connect with startups, with customers that will develop their own uh, APIs, their own focus. Uh, so the technology, again, as an enabler, is this important connection, right? And this is valid for business, on the, for instance, on commerce, on supply chains, on bringing the uh, agile moment for, for the companies. But this is also very valid for topics like, for instance, sustainability, right? Uh, when we talk a little bit and touch it in some of the topics on, on, on diversity, that this is a top of mind of the new generation. When you talk about, for instance, sustainability, there is no way that the technology is not there connecting ecosystems. Yeah, when you talk about circular economy, when you talk about uh, finding new uh, uh, supply uh, mechanisms across the world. So at the end of the day, uh, the, the whole uh, opportunity that technology can bring, connecting different players, and sometimes not the obvious one, uh, but guaranteeing that they are smoothly aligned with the one purpose that is create value to the companies and by the way, to the final customer that is uh, the, the, the ultimate goal for everybody. So I think connecting, making those connections with a very smart way and with different capabilities on the fast pace that the world requires, I think those are the fundamentals that are very, very vital for the companies as we continue uh, developing our, our society and how fast we can react uh, in, in our business environment. Thank you, Christina. Really, really interesting views. So, so we have a few more minutes for questions from the audience. Um, I'm receiving a message that we have uh, Anali Duarte from Bank of America with a question. Uh, I don't know, Anali, if you can turn on your your video and, and mic. Hey, 
you hear me? Yes. Can you see me? Yes. Oh, that that's great. And that's a great conversation. Thank you so much for this great conversation. So good to see you. And my question is to you, Chris. Very good to have you here. And you all talked about uh, innovation and digital transformation, right? So we know that we're going to face all those like payment ecosystem that has been changing a lot. So what we're going to face, so what are the challenges that we're going to face with this uh, data protection law? So how to be very competitive in an environment like that? Yeah, good uh, topic, Kennedy. Well, good to see you. And especially in your industry, is a super exciting topic and, and it's critical. I would say that it's core uh, for you. Uh, we are pretty connected on the whole uh, privacy, especially being a European German company. Uh, we really take this pretty serious. Uh, and I think, uh, again, on the technology perspective, uh, it is a fundamental topic uh, to take into consideration how the data is going to be managed, uh, what is going to bring, especially with the new companies on the fintech that are coming, how this is being used. So I think more and more the companies are, are, are noticing that the, the data is not from the company and how you handle, you are you must be accountable for that. Yeah, one of the studies from Accenture is showing about the post digital effect, one of the specific ones on data privacy and how to manage the, the whole the high cyber security puts all the responsibility on the company. So it's on our hands to guarantee that the data is protected, that is well established who is using and from the whole uh, company, this is not just the technology topic, is how the different areas, marketing, uh, on the HR perspective, on the employee perspective, there's a lot of data privacy. So understanding uh, the deepness of how to use the data, where to store the data is, is uh, really fundamental. How to monetize the data is also another topic. And I think uh, moving forward on, on the aspect of the, uh, of the legal uh, perspective is important, but there is one topic that we have been discussing a lot inside SAP and we even created a, a committee on that, is on the ethical part of using data. Uh, we see more and more this becoming very common to see how everybody is monetizing the data, how we are using data, especially in companies like ours that have critical information inside our business. And what you do with that perspective, I think this is the most critical part as we progress. So looking not just on how the technical part operate, but on the ethical part, I think this is going to differentiate the companies as we progress. Yeah, who are the companies that take this topic seriously and who not will disappear because it's a critical point for us as a, as a, as a society to guarantee the good usage of, of the data that uh, is provided to our companies. Thank you. Thank you, Annalie, and thank you, Christina. Thank you, Annalie. We have time for one more question, uh, uh, and I think Jorge Cassini from Salesforce uh, has one. I don't know if you can turn on your video and mic. Here, hi, hi, Tim, do you hear me? Yes, perfectly well. N nice to meet you, Tim. It's very fruitful co conversation. Uh, I'm here thinking a little bit out of the box, and one of the, the questions I have is what about, uh, we talked about the pandemic as an accelerator for the transform, digital transformation. What about other uh, opportunities and, and uh, headwinds or tailwinds you, do you foresee in the near future for, for LATAM and specifically for, for Chile? Jorge, is a question for anyone in particular. Well, for let me start, in particular, let me start first as I'm the only Chilean in the room. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gaston is almost Chilean by now. Uh, I'm an, an adopted Chilean, so <laughs> I can also compliment your answer if you want. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm pretty optimistic of, of the future of our country. Um, as you all know, we are in the process of um, of rebuilding our. Um, uh, institutional, um, our institutions, uh, with uh, many, many, many elections to be held during this year. And uh, for a country like ours, uh, that also sits on a very wealthy mining uh, treasure, uh, the future should be bright. Um, because of technology, it's also um, fueling 
a huge demand for the commodities we trade, like copper and lithium and, and the like. And uh, as, the, as the country uh, moves also for a much broader consensus of where we should be headed for the, for the coming years, um, if you add that uh, to, uh, to what we have learned during the pandemics, because uh, and, and Gaston, this, uh, he knows this much better than me, we have learned a lot and we will keep on learning a lot. Um, I see for, for a country like ours, which is also a stable one and, and, and one that it's in the same uh, uh, time zone of, uh, east, of the East Coast in the US, um, a great place for, for business, a, a great place to live, and, uh, and a land that's gonna be full of opportunities. The only thing that concerns me, to be honest, it's uh, our size. Huh? We're a small country at the end of the world. So we have to keep on going elsewhere. And uh, Chilean companies has been very successful and going uh, abroad, uh, but that's a trend for the years to continue. I don't know, Gaston, if you wanna add something on that. Yeah, maybe uh, you, you took a very um, macro view. Maybe I can, I can take the very short term uh, micro view, which is I think uh, in terms of tailwinds and going beyond the pandemic, I think there is a significant level of savings in, 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 in the hands of, of consumers. In, I think in Chile in particular, but it is also true for many countries in Latin America, the, the pandemic has the problem of you know, slowing down economic uh, activity, but at the same time, it slowed down and, 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 and postponed a lot of consumption uh, and uh, and I think that's going to be something we're going to see uh, in the near term uh, for 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 many industries as a as a tailwind, uh, both financial, retail, etc. Uh, I think more looking a little bit longer term uh, and from the consumer standpoint, uh, smartphone and and internet penetration has really grown in the region, uh, but technology adoption is not just an event, it's a process. Uh, and as the whole process of both people learning how to use technology, but also us as, uh, you know, developers of solutions, as, uh, as uh, Ignacio was saying, learn how to develop those solutions better, improve those solutions. I think there is a an incredible tailwind of technology adoption, and as a result of that, a lot more efficiency and activity in how people live their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's in hand in hand with an emerging middle class that we're seeing, uh, I think not only in Chile, in Peru, in Colombia, in, in Brazil as well, uh, that is really uh, providing or has the potential to provide a lot of growth to our countries in the in the next years. So I think taking a more consumer focused view, we, we can imagine at least two or three sources of, you know, energy for us to move forward in the next few years. Thank you. Thank you. And it's great to hear, you know, positive short and medium to long term views both from you, Gaston and Ignacio, we really appreciate it. So, so maybe as closing remarks, um, I started today by introducing this concept of a bionic company, you know, a company that, you know, effectively combines the strengths of humans and of technology to create, you know, these superhuman or bionic capabilities. And I think that uh, Cristina, Ignacio, Gaston and Alvaro showed us how the companies they lead are investing significantly on their transformations. Um, they've explained how they are significantly revamping their technological and AI capabilities, uh, how they are deploying collaboration models with broader ecosystems of companies. It was very clear in the case of Falabella, in the case of BCI, in the case of Diageo. Um, and how in this process of developing these you know, ecosystems, they are, you know, really coming with innovative business models that have the potential to significantly change business as usual. But to me, it has become 
even more clear than before that the real challenge of these transformations is human. All of them spoke a lot in terms of how the, the challenges that we are, ha are, ha are having on, on attracting and retaining employees that have these design and technical skills and that are flexible, adaptable and able to learn and how to break, you know, the organizational silos and the organizational inertia to make, you know, traditional companies more flexible, innovative and closer to clients and, and fast to market. And that most of all these transformations, and I think that we have great examples today around this, how these transformations are guided by a strong sense of purpose. I think purpose was one of the most mentioned words throughout the call, a purpose that really puts client and other stakeholders at the center of transformations. And that by doing so also, you know, energizes and aligns the organization and around what they are trying to achieve. So, Deep, deep thanks to Cristina, Ignacio, Alvaro, and Gaston. I really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, and I think it's been really a rich, provocative, and insightful one. So thank you a lot. Thank well, you, guys. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a what, pleasure. Thanks, everyone. What an amazing conversation. Thank you, Federico, Cristina, Gaston, Alvaro, and Ignacio. It has really been amazing as we touch on the topics that are going to drive our drive us as we go into the medium term. So it's been great to hear all of you today. Um, and we all look forward to working with you um, towards our region's recovery. Uh, I wanna thank the audience for joining us today. It has been a pleasure to host you as part of our first Council of the Americas Symposium Panel of the Year. I hope to see you all soon. And I wish you and your families that you all stay well, healthy, and hopefully get vaccinated very soon. Have a good evening and thank you again for joining us.